Happy New Year! Well, did you stay up all night, uh, Thursday night? And... I'm afraid I'm really getting old. I, I don't think I lasted until 10.30, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I tell you what, um, Connie and I are learning that Bloomingtonians definitely know how to party. I don't think anywhere that we have lived during our interim assignments all over the country, nowhere that we have lived has celebrated so loud and so long on New Year's Eve as uh, Bloomington did. And San Bernardino too, huh? Oh my goodness. Our poor dog. Wow. Uh, I, I actually, uh, my got my hair cut this last week and the gal who styles my hair she said uh, what are you doing for new year's and i said old people things i'm going to sleep and and i'm and i'll be i'll, I'll be kind of protecting our dog from all of the 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 loud noises he does not like this stuff and uh, she actually recommended that i give him cbd you don't know what that is do you <laughs> That's pot. And uh, <laughs> she said they take all of the hallucinogenics out of it, okay? It just, just calms them down. Yeah, well, he just spent the night under our bed, so no big deal, all right? I, uh, we are in a new year. Can everybody say amen? Thank you, Jesus. Uh, of course, there's no reason to expect that uh, anything has changed other than the name of the month, and the calendar year. Uh, but the reality is God's still in control. And I'm his kid. And if you know Jesus, you're his kid too. And uh, he's orchestrating all of this for your benefit. Do you believe that? I do. If I didn't, uh, there'd be really no reason for me to be here up here up here in front of you, that's for sure. Um, as starting out the new year, uh, of course, there are logistical details that need to be taken care of. One of the things that I want you to help me with, uh, you have your connection card there, and um, there are letters on the bottom of it. You're fully aware of those. Uh, I need to update, update my pastor's prayer partner team. You may not even be aware that that is a thing, but it is. And uh, there are about 40 people here from the church. Um, our second or third Sunday, I uh, recruited this team. And uh, so every week I send out an update email, prayer requests, and what's going on in the church, and just kind of keeping connected via email every week to that team. And then every week, one quarter of that team meets with me up in my office uh, before the message Sunday morning, and we pray together for all of us here, for everything that's happening in the church. I need to update that. If you are currently a part of that team, but for whatever reason, and there are, there's no judgment here, okay, but your circumstances have changed and you need to not be a part of that team for now, uh, or if you are not part of that team and would like to be a part of that team, then I need to know. So would you, on the bottom of your connection card, make sure that your name is clearly printed on top, and then just circle P for prayer partner, and uh, jot me a note, either above that P or on the back, whatever. I would like to be added to the team. Uh, I need to step back from my responsibilities at this point. Anything in there, okay? Uh, I, I would really appreciate your input there. And for some of you who were not here possibly when, we, when I first recruited the team, uh, and you'd like to be a part of it, I would really like to get some fresh blood in there too. So uh, that's good. All right. Well, uh, I, I, uh, I am, I'm going to start a series, and I'm still in this 
<clears throat> this allergy thing, okay, so my voice will fade in and out. Uh, but uh, I'm going to start a series today that is very, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I have taught in different settings, of course, over the years. Uh, I taught what I'm going to be sharing with you uh, over the next seven weeks at the college level. Taught it several times. And it's basically an introduction to Christian theology. What's theology? Theology is the study of God. Some of you are saying, oh boy, I can't wait. Well, I can't wait to get to it because I think this is some of the most practical stuff that we can possibly address, especially today. As my prayer partners and I met this morning, uh, one of the issues that we prayed for was a true spiritual revival to sweep our land. The closest thing to to a a true historic revival, a spiritual revival of the movement of God among us, the closest that I've ever experienced to that was the Promise Keepers movement. And I think that truly was a movement of God. There is no way, other way that you can explain. Uh, I think the largest gathering I was at, besides the 1.4 million on the mall in... uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., to pray for rec- racial reconciliation, to repent of racism, and to, uh, uh, to ask God's forgiveness and each other's forgiveness and to grow beyond that. Besides that, the largest stadium event I was at was the one here at the Coliseum. I believe it was uh, 70,000 men plus. There is no way you can explain 70,000 men coming to one spot for two reasons. To sing, that just doesn't make any sense. Guys don't do that. And the second reason is to hear somebody else talk, to hear somebody preach to them. Doesn't happen. Men don't do that naturally. But there was something much bigger, much stronger, much more important happening there. It was a true movement of God's Spirit. It was awesome. That's the closest I have ever come in my personal experience to experiencing that true, dynamic, miraculous presence of God moving among humankind. But it has happened throughout human history. It certainly happened in the history of our country, the Great Awakenings. Uh, that we have that we experienced none of us were alive then but those great awakenings literally shaped the nation that we live in today today our nation is rejecting so much of the foundational principles of who god is and who god has created you and me to be that we are, I believe, certainly in my lifetime, we have never stood as a nation, as a world, in greater need of God's divine intervention than now. And I think that's going to happen, well, I know, it always starts with God's people. If my people who are called by name, (laughs) by my name, will change their ways, repent. That's Christians, repent. Repent. I'm going to talk about a thing here in just just a couple of minutes that really breaks my heart. I'll I'll share it when we get there. My mom. My mom was a godly, godly woman. I learned how to love Jesus through her. Um, Because of her godly influence on me, I, I am who I am today. But my mom was one who held in great suspect higher learning, higher education. Her dad was a PhD in ancient European history. He taught at Whittier College. He actually taught President Nixon when Nixon was going there. Uh, 
He was a man not only of letters, but incredibly well-educated in so many areas. Uh, and from my mom's perspective, with the, the more highly educated my grandpa, her dad became, the cooler he became spiritually. My grandpa is one who journaled every day. Do any of you do that? Uh, I Do you? Good for you. Good for you. You will be thankful for that as the years go by. Uh, my, my youngest sister and Connie, basically, my wife, are in the process of transcribing my great-grandfather, my grandfather's journals. And uh, I tell you what, as we read through these and attempt to put them into a communicable form, because the script of that day was not easily read, uh, it becomes more and more apparent to me my grandpa's faith never waned and it never cooled. Um, but because my mom uh, believed that that was the case, uh, she really gave me no support in my uh, college work. Um, I basically paid my way through, uh, through college, through undergraduate work, uh, into graduate school uh, with my teaching credential. Uh, got no support, you know, emotionally or certainly financially from my mom. And then when I felt like God wanted me to go to seminary, oh my goodness, I could almost see my mom's countenance drop. And I, I, John, you're going to lose your faith. <laughs> well, maybe because she had that attitude, I went into it saying, it ain't going to happen to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow the Holy Spirit to take the, the data, the information, the knowledge, and deepen my relationship with him instead of weaken it. And that's exactly what he's done. And this is why I want to launch into what I'm going to be addressing for the next seven weeks. I have been, honestly and candidly, I have been very positively impressed by the level of spiritual understanding and biblical knowledge that I have experienced and heard here at the Bridge Church. I, I stand amazed. I think part of it is because of your... Uh, history in Christian education. I'm sure that's a lot of it with Bloomington Christian School. Uh, and so I, I don't go into this because I think somehow you're, you're basically uninformed. Please don't hear that from me. But what I have un uh, come to understand over the years is to assume that someone who is a believer, who is a Christian, who knows that they have been born again and that they will spend eternity with God in heaven because of their faith in Jesus, to assume that they understand some of the foundational principles that God's Word communicates to us, uh, to assume that they understand all of those is a wrong assumption. Uh, and so... I am going to do my best to, to set the platter out, to set a, a thanksgiving feast, if you will, for you, informationally and biblically in these next seven weeks. And it's my prayer that um, you will, first of all, approach this not with the attitude, oh, I wonder if he'll say anything new that I don't know today. Don't go there, please. Don't, don't, don't approach this with that kind of attitude. I know that's a temptation. I know it is. In fact, that's the attitude that I usually go when I am forced to go to leadership or pastoral conventions of any kind. That's probably you didn't need to know that. Uh, but um, don't approach it that way. Please ask the Holy Spirit, would you? Open me up to something 
new and fresh, perhaps a bit just different perspective, if not totally new information. Uh, Holy Spirit, I want to understand you better so that I can experience you more completely. So, I, I am not, this is what I'm going to present to you is not what we could be called a Christian apologetic. In other words, I am not trying to prove Christianity to you. What, what I will be communicating in these next seven weeks assumes that Christianity is true. Now, I will give you some reasoning for that assumption, but uh, I'm not going to try and prove it, okay? This is something totally different. I, okay, do you want to know who God is really? Uh, Melissa, you constructed a worship set this morning for us that was profound. And I assume that you constructed it knowing what I was going to preach because you didn't. Oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit did that. It's amazing how often God does that. Wow, that is very cool. But it could not have been more appropriate for where we're going here in these next few weeks. So you want to know who God is. Well, you're not alone. My undergraduate work at San Diego State University was, uh, uh, my major was ge geography. And it, with an emphasis on the human end of things, on the cultural end of it. So I did a lot of anthropological work uh, trying to understand why people do what we have done throughout the millennium. In that work... And I, I, it was true when I finished my work. I, don't, I haven't heard that it's changed at all. An extraordinary reality has surfaced. We have never discovered a people group on the planet. A group of people heretofore unknown, unreached, unexposed to any other peoples outside of themselves. We have never discovered a people group who had not all on their own attempted to understand, to define who God is. You, you, you're very well aware, Louis Pasteur, the, the, he was actually a theologian and a scientist. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum inside of every one of us. And of course, nature abhors a uh, 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 vacuum, it constantly tries to fill it, and that God-shaped vacuum inside of us is trying to be filled all the time by someone or something. That is this urge that every human person that's ever walked the planet, every people group, have tried to define, tried to understand the, <clears throat> the transcendent. <clears throat> We call it religion. There has never been discovered an irreligious people group on the planet. There is something inside of us that wants to know who God is. Interestingly, most people groups, at least later in their development, uh, developed a religious system that includes multiple gods. We call that polytheism. Now, I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a few moments. But interestingly, if you go far enough back, and you have to go pre-written history, back in these people groups, but there have been those who have studied this extensively, and if you go all the way back, as far as you can go, into the oral tradition of the, the original people groups, they all started as monotheists. That means one God. One God. Now, I've been privileged to do a little bit of reading over the years. My mom, who I talked about, was kind of uh, fearful of higher education. <laughs> she... Uh, 
she she's with the Lord now, but quite often she would send me books or other things. And one time she sent me a book, and it was called uh, "The Real Meaning of the Zodiac." And my heart kind of sunk, and I'm going, "Mom, give me a break. You, you, you're not buying into that stuff, are you?" And uh, But out of respect and honor for my mom, I read the book. It's one of the most profound and helpful books that I have ever read. It's by Dr. D. James Kennedy. You've heard that name, haven't you? D. James Kennedy, he's now with the Lord. Uh, But uh, he presented this in the most uh, layperson-friendly uh, form of any of the authors that I have followed after, and there were many before him from whom he drew. But this is the bottom line uh, message of the real meaning of the zodiac. When you go back far enough into oral tradition, pre written tradition of any people group on the planet, Every one of those original people groups had identified the 12 major constellations in the night sky. You say, so, big deal. One of the extraordinary things is, every one of those people groups, no matter how far they were separated by miles geographically, they all had the same name, for the same house of the Zodiac. Now, now think about that for a minute. Um, Ursa Major, what's that usually called by us normally? Come on, you got brains. If you want to go take a nap, you can... All right, but, but please think with me. Ursa Major is what? Big Dipper. Ursa means what? Bear. It's the big bear. Does the Big Dipper look like a bear? No. There are a few of the constellations that look like their name. Scorpio is a big scorpion. Looks like you can actually, takes a little bit of imagination, but you can, you can see it. Most of the 12 houses of the Zodiac, though, do not look like what they're called. And yet every people group, no matter how far they range from one another geographically, no common language, they all named the, the, the house by the same name. Go beyond that. They did not worship the stars as we worship them today, as those who follow the zodiac do. No. They understood that each one of those houses of the zodiac communicated a different part of God's plan of redemption. You go back far enough, and it's like reading the New Testament and Old Testament combined in how God, how God created it all, what, what, what went wrong with the fall and the, and the rebellion in the garden, and then uh, all of the, the history building up to the promised one whose birth we just celebrated, his death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, All of that in detail was described in the different houses of the Zodiac. So much so that when you go back to those very elemental beginnings, it's called commonly by those who have studied it, gospel in the stars. It's remarkable. Uh, I I, uh, actually went online uh, in preparation for today again and I wanted to see if there were any of the uh, the real meaning of the zodiac books available, and of, because when Kennedy died, they closed his publishing house down, and so only the books that had been printed at that point uh, still remain. There are no new copies left. Well, I think there are a couple, but they're like 250 bucks a piece. Uh, there is a used one I, I found available for 28 dollars. 
And I know that sounds expensive, but if you are a reader and if you want something that will encourage and strengthen your understanding and your faith of who God is and how He has been communicating Himself to the world from the very beginning, oh, you need to read this. In fact, I developed, uh, after I read it, I developed a five week series that I preached during Christmas on it. It was awesome. Not going to do that for you. Probably won't be here next Christmas. But, uh, oh, I encourage you to do that. So, it appears as though from the elemental beginnings of all cultures understanding one God and a plan of salvation that he had to reunite his creation with himself, that degenerated into many gods, into polytheism. Because there's a common tendency uh, in human thought in general, certainly in human literature, for things to start relatively simple. And then through the course of years and generations, for it to become more and more complex. A very, very real example of that that you are probably familiar with. How many Gospels are there in the New Testament? You're there. I know you're awake. You've already answered one. How many Gospels are there in the New Testament? There are four. Three of them are called synoptic Gospels. Do you know what that means? Syn, S-Y-N-O-P-T-I-C. Syn means... Together, optic means viewed together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke together look at the, uh, uh, the uh, come on, uh, one day at a time development of and what Jesus did and what he said. John, his gospel was written for another reason, and his primary reason was to to help us understand that he wasn't just another man, he was God himself in the flesh. But the first three Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, all look together at the chronological development of Jesus, the Son of Man's life. As far as we can tell, the Gospel of Mark was the first one to be written. Now how do we know that? There, there are several uh, things that I am not well enough informed of to even describe them to you. But some very simple things are this. Because of this reality, generally things start simple and they get more complex. Mark is the shortest of all of the three synoptic Gospels. Mark is written almost with an immediacy. In fact, uh, if you, depending on the translation that you use, Mark is writing almost breathlessly, and he uses the word immediately dozens of times. And immediately Jesus did this, and immediately this happened, and immediately this happened. But his description was very clear, very concise, relatively short. Matthew and Mark, as far as we can tell... <clears throat> took, or Matthew and Luke, they took Mark's basic outline of, of the chronology of Jesus' life and expanded on it. Matthew started looking at the, uh, uh, the chronology that Mark developed and he filled in, uh, the, the, he kind of filled in the blanks to help Jews especially understand that Jesus was the Son of Man. Luke, he filled in, and his, Luke is the longest of all of the Gospels, and uh, Luke, uh, my goodness, did he expand on this, but the basic outline of Mark is just indelibly imprinted on both Matthew and Luke. So we have the earliest one, the simplest one, Mark, and it becomes more and more complicated, more highly developed, more detailed in both Matthew and Luke. That is the common tendency, and it certainly is the tendency even religiously. So even though the, the primordial beginnings of, of human culture, 
Because of this compulsion, this God-shaped vacuum, they wanted to know who was bigger and more powerful than themselves. And they started out, because of the gospel and the stars probably, they started out understanding there was one creator God to whom they were accountable and by whom they were loved. And then (laughs) our human tendencies started to kick in And we started to make it much, much more complicated. And that's where the the many God things came in. There are there are basically three categories of religion. These are not new to you. The first one we've talked about is monotheism. This is the assumption that there is one creator God. There are three major world religions today that are monotheistic. Which are they? Do you know? Talk to me. Christianity. Judaism. Judaism. Oh, it's already there. (laughs) Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are the three major world religions that teach that there is one God. the, the second category of religion is what we've mentioned, polytheism. The, the assumption that there are multiple gods. Uh, the, 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 mul- the world religions that teach this, uh, Hinduism was chronologically the first one developed. Uh, it was developed a little bit after uh, Judaism, actually, uh, somewhere this side of 2000 BC. When I was in India, uh, where the primary religion is Hinduism, I was in India in 1985, and when I was there, um, uh, I was told that in Hinduism there are 64 million gods, approximately. There's no way to number them but approximately 64 million. Uh, So Hinduism and Buddhism, but the other major religion of the world today that's polytheistic is Mormonism. You may not be aware of it, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Mormons use biblical terminology for the most part, uh, and they talk about one God, They even translate Jehovah or Yahweh as that one God. But what they teach is that there was a point in time when Yahweh was a man just like you and me. And he worked his way to become a God. And he was given his own planet, this planet. And one of the sayings is... uh, As man is, God once was. And as God is, man can be. One of the most polytheistic religions on the planet. Don't get sucked in. Not going to go much further than that. The third category of religion is what's called animism. In animism, we have divine powers attributed to multiple inanimate and animate objects, rocks, trees, fire, sun, moon, eagles, wolves. Uh, Most native uh, religions uh, were and are uh, animistic. New Age, Um, and Connie and I just served a year in uh, in Sedona, uh, kind of the birthplace of American New Ageism. Uh, thankfully, it's kind of waning uh, at this point, being, uh, sh- being seen for what it really is. Uh, but uh, New Ageism basically sees everything as divine in itself. Um, there are, but let's, let's concentrate on monotheism because that's where we find ourselves. That's what the Bible describes to us. There are three forms of monotheism. The first one is called deism. 
D-E-I-S-M, deism. Now let me give you a technical definition of it and then try and understand it a little more completely. Deism says that God created the universe, endowed it with natural powers and laws, and left it to run its own course with little or no control on his part. Sometimes it's called the watchmaker model of God. God created all that is like a watchmaker designs a beautiful timepiece. But when he's done creating the timepiece, he sets it on a mantle and, and watches it until it either disintegrates or whatever. But he has very little to do with it. This is deism. Deism uh, emphasizes God's transcendence. God is way too big, way too complicated, so much other, so much profoundly other than you and I uh, that uh, we, we can't even begin to comprehend who he is, let alone interact with him. He has no desire to interact with us. Actually, that's, uh, that's Allah, by the way. That's one of the definitions of Allah in Islam. So deism uh, emphasizes God's transcendence, the separateness, the apartness of God. Now I need to pause here because from my personal observation and experience, and I'm not looking at anybody, but what I am afraid is true today, way too many folks who call themselves Christians They may believe that God is something other than a deistic God, a God who created and then just leaves us alone. But that's not the way they live. They live as if God really doesn't give a rip. How could a loving, involved God allow COVID? Have you asked yourself that question? <laughs> Surely God created. There, there's, I mean, it, it makes sense that there had to be a beginning to all of this and a progenitor for it. So certainly there is a creator, but certainly he can't be involved right now. I believe that one of the reasons that our nation has gotten to the point that it has gotten right now. One of the reasons <laughs> that the election went the way it went this last year was because a significant proportion of those who call themselves Christians believe in God, but not that he's involved or cares about what's happening right now. And not until those who call themselves children of God by faith in Jesus, not until we get back into the kind of intimacy with God for which we are created, obedient, vulnerable, authentic intimacy, not until we get back there will our world stop spinning out of control. And it may not even happen then. Jesus may come back and it'll still be major, major chaos. In fact, if we look at Scripture and understand it correctly, that's exactly what's going to happen. So it ain't going to get better until Jesus comes back. But I don't believe that means that God does not have another great awakening just waiting in the wings for the Christian church in America and worldwide. If we'll stop acting like, yeah, he's real, but you know, certainly he's not active today. It, it, until we get out of that, which is a very lazy Christianity, until we get out of that and start understanding him for who he is, we're in deep trouble. Three forms of monotheism. One is deism. 
The second is called pantheism. In pantheism, the definition is, is this. God and the universe are one and the same. And that God is all and all is God. Hmm. Have you heard anyone say recently, <clears throat> be careful what you put out into the universe? You don't want to say that. I mean, the, the universe might not like that and it'll get back at you. Have you heard it? Come on, have you heard anybody say that? Again and again and again. What in the world's going on? Well, we have left as a culture, hopefully not as a church, but as a culture, we have rejected one creator God to whom we are responsible and who loves us and is intimately involved in who we are and what's going on here. We have rejected that to the point where it's just the universe and me. How many of you enjoyed the very first in theater Star Wars? You didn't? Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness. The force is strong in this one. The force. This was the beginnings of the roots of, in our contemporary ideology, it, it was the beginnings of what's called pantheism. It's just this all-encompassing force, and it's either benevolent or malevolent, and, and we can't get away from it, and it really doesn't matter what we do. We either have them or we don't. Yeah, well, you see, pantheism emphasizes the imminence of God. And, and now I'm not talking about uh, the imminent return, the soon return. That is very true. I'm talking about the imminence of God. He is right here, right now. The, the, the pantheistic understanding, the, the universalist understanding is that God is so right now and right here that he is as much in that chair as he is in me. That's pantheism. The third form of monotheism, and this is, I hope, where you're living today, but it's called theism, T-H-E-I-S-M. This says that God is the creator, sustainer, and governor of the universe, and all that therein is. You know that I didn't write that. I don't talk like that. That's a de definition from a book, okay? God is the creator, sustainer, and governor of the universe and all that therein is. It emphasizes a balance between God's imminence. He's right here, right now, involved. And he's also transcendent. He's both separate and with. That's who God is. That's who God, the, the Bible describes and reveals God to be. Let me take you to Colossians, a very well-known portion let me read it for you. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul says this, For through him, Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world, everything that was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all things, all creation together. So, what does this theistic passage tell us about God? Well, first of all, obviously, God created. Now we say, well, duh. Have you ever thought about, though, what, when something is created and described as being created, what does that tell you about that thing? It is not an accident. It is designed. It is intentional. It has purpose. 
as God's creation, you and I are all of those things. Another thing that it tells us, God is the first and only, and this is my term, God is the first and only sufficient cause. Now what is a sufficient cause? Most of us, especially as parents, are always trying to find out sufficient causes. We, we see, we watch one of our kids doing something that we have taught them not to do and told them that if they do, there will be repercussions. And we watch them do it anyway. And we try and figure out a sufficient cause. What compelled my son to do that? Sometimes it's relatively simple to figure out. They were hungry. Uh, uh, sometimes it's very obvious they did it simply because I told them not to. We're always trying to find out sufficient causes. I, I have been I'm not significantly trained, but I have had... Uh, uh, quite a bit of training in psychology and in counseling. In the counseling room, the counselor is always trying to discern a sufficient cause for whatever behavior is, uh, is apparent in the client. If the client is depressed, if the client is, is angry, if the client is paranoid, Generally, you try and dig in and find out a sufficient cause that, that would be significant enough to cause what we see happening in this person's life. We're always trying to get to the sufficient cause. What Paul's uh, letter here in Colossians chapter 1 tells us is that when it comes to all of the physical cosmos... And the spiritual cosmos, there is only one sufficient cause for that, and that is God. Today, in our attempt to find sufficient cause, scientifically, uh, we've gone to the Big Bang Theory, to all kinds of other things. But the bottom line, even if you, even if you adhere to the Big Bang Theory... What caused the Big Bang? Is there a sufficient cause for the Big Bang? According to Paul, God in Jesus is sufficient cause for all that we see. That's how involved he is. That begs the question... If he is the sufficient cause, then why did he either cause or allow COVID? Have you even asked yourself that question? <laughs> uh, I ain't going there today, but there will be a day if I have time. I, I want to explore what the Bible says about who is God when it hurts. And COVID hurts. But I digress. Another thing that this passage reveals to us is that Jesus holds me together. Did you catch the phrase? I know you've read it before. He, Jesus, holds all creation together. This is true on, on so many levels. About a year and a half ago, I was recommended a book called Quantum Glory. And it's a Christian perspective on quantum mechanics. Have you heard that term? Have you explored it at all? Do you have any idea what quantum mechanics are? Quantum mechanics are, is the study of the, the smallest elements of our physical universe. For years, uh, our scientists 
uh, believed and they had discovered because they could see them um, that the smallest elements of our physical universe were what they called atoms. And those atoms were made up of electrons and protons and neutrons. And they were held together by their opposite charges. That's why they didn't spin off and, and totally disintegrate. Well, quantum mechanics has much stronger instruments. And uh, they've kind of explored this issue. What is the smallest discernible as far as our contemporary scientific ability? What is the smallest element? And they came up with something that's been labeled a quark. Q-U-A-R-C-K, I think. A quark. It's not protons and electrons and neutrons. It's quarks. And quarks can be either a physical particle, little bitty piece, or it can be simply a, 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 a wave, a, an energy wave. I can't tell you that I understand all that I know about this, okay? It's mind-boggling. But they have come to a conclusion. And these were not Christian scientists who came to this conclusion. But they, they asked that question, what really, we thought that it was opposite electrical charge that, that held the universe together. Well, now we've gone way beneath that. And they said, what is it that holds all of these quarks together uh, to, where, to where there's actually a physical person called Ray that I can touch and I can't put my hand through his body? You don't want me to even try, do you? That's good. What is it? And you know what they've come to? The force that holds quarks together is light. How did Jesus describe himself? I am the light of the world. Now, was Jesus trying to be scientific? No. He was speaking, of course, spiritually. But as is so often the case in Scripture, what God has revealed to us is true on many, many, many different levels. Paul says, Jesus holds everything together. <laughs> the light of Jesus holds everything together. I am sure you have experienced it. But Jesus gives me meaning and purpose. And he does the same thing to you. He keeps me from disintegrating from just floating out into nothingness, from blowing my brains out. It's Jesus who brings that kind of light and that kind of hope. And it is he who holds me together. He holds you together. He holds us together as a body of Christ. And when we begin to remove the light... <laughs> things start to go pew, pew, pew. 2020 happens. One last thing. Jesus is intimately aware of and involved in every detail of my life and yours. How does any of this have anything to do with you sitting there right now? You chose to come to church this morning and you had no idea the farmer was going to be up there and spouting this kind of garbage and you're saying, what in the snot did I even come to here for this morning? I know some of you are saying that. You're thinking it. Either you're a deist. I will assume that. You're probably not a, an atheist, believing there is no God. 
You may be a pantheist. Somehow you think everything is God. And I'm just part of that and you're a part of that. Whatever that force may be. I hope you're not there. But you might be. But you may be a believer this morning who because life has been so painful you just couldn't make sense out of some of the things that have happened to you. You've come to the point where you've concluded okay, I guess God have cre- created me but certainly he's not involved in what's happening right now. He's all, you know, he's the ultimate intelligence, so he he probably knows, but he doesn't give a rip. And he's not involved, and he doesn't have a purpose for it. If you're there this morning, my brother or sister, you need to hear from God's Spirit what he said through the Apostle Paul, that Jesus holds all things together, including you. He wants to be that intimately and powerfully involved in your heart, your mind, your body, right now. That's who he is. We sung that. See, you didn't know how incredibly this, your songs this morning, it's who he is and it's who I am. 